again, there are some people who have the ability to change the world. Um, Marconi is probably one of the most complex and interesting characters I've ever researched, and this is 35 years of research, and I guess 11 or 12 books. Let's go back even further. Let's go back to um, 1854 in Cambridge University, and there's uh, a Scottish physicist called James Clark Maxwell. He's working by candlelight with a feathered plume, and he's writing a treatise called The Electrodynamical Study of Radiation. He looks up from that work and realises, or it will be realised, that he has defined what we now know as radio. This is electromagnetic radiation. He has basically said how radio waves work, that they'll be diffracted, they'll be reflected, that they can travel, they can bounce. He'd done it in most incredibly abstruse mathematics. It was so complex that a series of the best minds, the Maxwellians, um, Fitzgerald, Lodge, took 30 years to work out how good he was. And then it moves to Germany and a gentleman called Heinrich Hertz. People will know the name Hertz from frequency. It took his name. Hertz, a very young physicist working in Germany, he took Maxwell's equations and in a laboratory over a whole year of darkness tried to get a spark to jump between coils managed to work out that maestro Maxwell was correct the electromagnetic radiation radio waves existed and he wrote a paper on it in 1888 which changed the world I mean that is it so suddenly but at that time my, uh, radio is still a laboratory experiment uh, Lodge picks it up and he does uh, studies in 1894, he experiments, he shows it to the Oxford Union. And they can send sparks across 30, 40 yards of laboratory space. But nobody had the idea that it was uh, anything but an experiment. It was just a phenomenon. It was like mixing two chemicals and they change colour. It was just amusing and it amused um, engineers. And I guess that's where the world changes because it needed one man to bring it all together. Uh, he was born in 1874 in Italy. His father was an Italian nobleman. His mother was um, Annie Jameson. You'll know Jameson from Jameson Scotch whiskey, but it's Irish whiskey because they also own Hague. So Annie Jameson was one of the whiskey dynasty from Ireland and Scotland. She'd gone to uh, Italy to learn how to sing. She was a soprano. Strange how the story goes full circle. She'd met the much older Giuseppe Marconi, they fallen in love. Um, she was forbidden to marry him. She, she ran away. She ran away from her family, married him, um, and they, they went to uh, Genoa, uh, then on to Bologna where they lived. And um, Marconi came along in 1874. He had a very strange upbringing. Um, he was obviously caught between two worlds. His father, a, an, an older, staunchly Catholic a uh, nobleman, his mother, a very wealthy heiress who liked to travel Europe as part of the Grand Tour. So Marconi was dragged around Europe. He learned both languages. He was fluent in English and uh, Italian, although he spoke Italian with a terrible accent, apparently. Um, he could read and he could read German. He learned, taught himself uh, Russian. He could read French, uh, but he never went to school. He literally had a few private tutors, but he learned in his father's library. Uh, in fact, Marconi not only went to school, but he failed every exam he ever took. By his own definition, Marconi was not an engineer. He was not a scientist. He was not a mathematician. He was probably the world's first entrepreneur before the world had ever been invented. That word is 80 years in the future. But he looked at what was going on. All these engineers and researchers, an Indian researcher called Bose, He's sending sparks to light gunpowder across a compound in Bangladesh and Pakistan in 1890. William Priest, the 64-year-old head of the British Post Office, 88,000 employees, they, they dominate everything in telegraphs and telegrams. He's trying to send messages by using um, inductive cables along the seashore. It worked. He sent messages across Bristol Channel. He transmitted across Loch Ness. He even shut down all the telephone lines in... Um, Ireland and Wales for an entire night to try and transmit across the, um, the Irish Sea. It didn't work. There are, there are laws of physics you can't break. Uh, is that quoting Scotty? I think it probably is. His was a blind alley, and there was many blind alleys looking at induction and conduction, but you could see it building, and this is building, and there are scientists and engineers. Oliver Lodge has built a coherer, Anesti has built a different coherer. These are devices using metal filings to detect magnetic radiation. 
Marconi, in 1892, 1893, 1894, he read everything. He literally was a sponge. He failed his entrance exams to university twice. He failed his entrance exams to the Italian Navy. I'm reliably told by an Italian naval engineer that you had to write your name on the top and you'd get in, but he didn't want to be in the Navy. Let me just dispel one thing. So some images of Marconi as this rose-tinted, spectacled inventor slaving away in the attic. Yeah, it didn't happen. He was extraordinarily wealthy. He had servants. He had the whole attic room, which was, a, they call it the silk room because his grandfather used to breed silkworms. There was a story once he fell out with his father because he wouldn't let him buy any more wire and any more batteries. So he went down to market and sold a pair of shoes. It's a story we've told in Italy a few times. I've been lecturing out there. And this is always seen as, oh, Marconi struggling to be an engineer. But as someone said, it didn't matter because Marconi had an awful lot of pairs of shoes. By 1894, he has made his radio signal, taking all the ideas from all these other engineers, everything he read, added his own genius, which was to put an aerial in the, up in the sky instead of horizontal, and put an earth to the ground, and his range went from 100 yards to nearly two miles. The famous signals where he starts tapping Morse code out, he sends his half-brother Alfonso two miles away. When you hear it clicking in your ear, fire your shotgun. And they say some shots, the one that started the First World War, reverberate around the world. Well, that shot did. This is really the birth of radio, but it's not radio as we know it today. This is still a laboratory experiment. And one man, he's 19 years old in 1894, he has a dream. And he will follow that dream for the rest of his life, despite, for the next 10 years, the scientific community of Victorian England saying he's wrong, it won't work, every stage of the campaign, his development. But Marconi had certain skills, not an engineer, not an inventor, entrepreneur, but also he was phenomenally good with people. Up to a point, he could, he was almost, I think a good word is messianic, he attracted the best and the brightest to him, who believed in him. People would literally leave their promising careers and stay with them for the rest of his life. He just had this ability to drive people, he told his daughter Degna once, uh, genius, there is no such thing as genius. It's just hard work constantly applied. Marconi would work for 30, 40 hours until he collapsed, sleep for two, wake up and carry on. He was, he was basically obsessive, driven. He also learned very on that he became a master manipulator of the press and his clients. He could manage people. He knew they had to sell radio to make a business. He was the first person to really suffer from paparazzi. There'll be 20, 30 journalists in 1899 waiting for Marconi to come out. The latest idea from the Wizards of the Airwaves. He used to sneak out the back window. I mean, so we are talking this hugely complex figure. So Marconi comes to England in 1896. He arrives in February with his mother. He's 21 years old. He has no reputation, no scientific background. This is a very cold, lonely and quite smelly and smoky place. It's London in February 1896. Luckily, he has a distant cousin he hasn't seen since he was seven, Henry Jameson, part of the whiskey fortune of his mother, corn engineer and miller, who introduces him to Henry Priest. So William Priest is already working on his induction system. He realises it doesn't work. It's a, it's a dead end. He's also had a massive 30-year argument with Oliver Lodge about lightning um, and Oliver Lodge is also working on what we now know as radio. Marconi gets to see William Priest, demonstrates his equipment, literally you press the Morse key, a bell rings over there. And he rubbed his chin and went, that's really interesting. But it won't this annoy Lodge. And amazingly, he threw the entire way to the British Post Office behind Marconi. To cut a very long story short, within two months, he's sending messages over four, five, six miles and sold to a plane. Within a year, 31 miles, and the, the carriage and the, the cavalry team is almost at Bristol. Radio is born. He comes to the Isle of Wight here in 1897, and down at the Needles, he books the entire bottom floor over Christmas and into the winter months, and he sets up the world's first radio station. He hires two ships, two tugs, all paid for by his family. Uh, he recruits engineers, and he's suddenly steaming over an 18-mile triangle between Swanage Pier and Bournemouth Pier, demonstrating radio. By the summer of 1898, Marconi has a viable radio system that works in all weathers over ranges of up to 20 miles. 
That's incredible. As an engineer, I was an engineer with Mark for 20 years. What happened in that year is just incredible. He changes the world. And then, of course, nobody wants to buy it. <laughs>